take this journey with me. We're going to a place in the New Testament where some guys did whatever they had to do to get their friend to Jesus. They tore a roof off. And all I'm doing right now is asking you, be prepared to tear the roof off. Be prepared to tear the roof off the barrier that's representing between you and bringing people to Christ. So keep that thought in mind. We're in Mark chapter 2. Um, we're going to read the first 12 verses. So if you've got a Bible, go to Mark chapter 2. And let me tell you, this is, this is really uh, more verses than what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to do one part today and then part two next week. Because there are really two miracles. There is the miracle of the guy who's a paralytic. He's healed. And he, and he walks. Then there's the miracle of Jesus forgiving his sin. Which was the greatest miracle. And just let me add to that. The greatest miracle that God will ever do for you is the day he saves your soul. The day he forgives your sin, that's the greatest miracle he will ever do in your life. And that's in the story. But we'll talk about that next week. I want to talk about the guys who brought him. I want to ask four questions. And then one question personally to you. Here are the four questions. Who was the guy? Who brought him? Where did they bring him? And the last one, how did they get him there? Okay, so remember those. Let me read verse 1, chapter 2. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home. Now I believe home represents Simon Peter's home. Okay, so Jesus didn't have a home, but he kind of called that home his because of the disciple Simon Peter. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their heart. Why does this man speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or rise, take up your bed, and walk? Now, let's pause there just for a second. The question is, which is easier to say to this crippled man, your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk? And the answer is, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Why? Who knows? How could you tell? So you can easily say that. So, I mean, if there's somebody here in a wheelchair and, 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 and I look at him... It would be a lot easier for me to just say, hey, man, your sins are forgiven. Because none of you would know. But if I look at him and say, throw that wheelchair down. Get up and walk. Every eye in this place would be on him. And you would know whether or not I had the power to do it. So watch what Jesus does. When he doesn't get an answer, he does this. He says, so that, verse 10, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed, and he went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and they glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. May the Lord do it again. The greatest miracle in this story is not the paralytic walks. It's his sins were forgiven. The reason he walked is so that Jesus could prove he had forgiven his sins. But we'll talk about that next week. Let's go back to those questions. Number one, who was the guy? Well, we don't see a name. All we see is a paralytic carried by four men. Here's the answer. He was somebody who could not get to Jesus on his own. He was somebody who could not get to Jesus on his own. Can I remind you that's what you were? 
before Christ came in your life? The Bible says in sin we're paralyzed. In sin we're dead in our trespasses and sin. So in other words, when we are still sinners, we're crippled. We're broken. And so this man couldn't get to Jesus, so what happened, friends, brought him. Has it ever dawned on us that we're never going to reach the world? We're not going to reach the city of Orlando by putting up a bigger sign saying, lucky sinners, y'all come on in. They're not coming. Why? They have no desire to come. When you go to the beach and you look out in the waves and a guy's drowning, he's caught in undertow or whatever, and he's yelling for you, how much good does it do him for you to go, man, I'm cheering for you and I'm praying for you. I want you to know that. I go to First Baptist and we love guys like you, and so I'm praying you're going to be okay. It does no good. Somebody's got to go in and get him. Don't give him a website. Go to him. When God saw us in our sin, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Isn't it amazing that God didn't wait on us to come to him because we couldn't. Remember? We were sinners. Sin separated us from God. So what did God do? He came to us. I believe that the hope of this church reaching the city of Orlando does not lie in the fact we get together on Sunday. I think it lies in the fact that we go all over the city on Monday and we go to our world and we invite and we carry just like they carried their friend. So the first answer, he's a man who was not going to come. He needed help. So does your friend. So do your neighbors. So does the city of Orlando. Second question, who brought him? Well, my Bible says four men. I don't have any names in mine. Do you have any names in yours? We don't have any names. I heard a gospel song where they each got a name. I've heard sermons where one of them was named encouragement, one of them was named blessing or something. It, it, crazy, but we don't have a name, okay? Here's what we know. Who carried this guy? Four guys who cared enough to carry him. These men loved that guy. In fact, so much so, Jesus saw their faith. Go back to verse 5. This is amazing to me. Last night in the middle of the sermon, I mean, I'm sitting here, and in the middle of the sermon last night, it just, it hit me what verse 5 actually says. Let, let me just read it to you. And when Jesus saw their faith, Whose faith? Whose faith? The four guys, not the paralytic. So what was it that Jesus saw? How did he see their faith? Because of what they were willing to do. I think he saw their passion for this guy. I think he saw their friendship and their love for their brother. And it moved him. Have we done anything that would make Jesus see our faith? To demonstrate that we are sold out. We are committed to reach as he reached us. So here's the point. The greatest church growth principle I know is not location. It's not cappuccino, contemporary music. I mean, we got the best. Uh, do we not have the best? This is unbelievable. And I don't know if you caught... <laughs> Uh, Chris Ogden leaned over in the service before this one and said, would you look on the platform? We have a mashup of May Day Parade and Avalon. Now, where else would that work except First Baptist Orlando? I mean, you got Jason, you know, with May Day Parade and, and Go Radio, and then Avalon, and they are singing in one voice to the Lord. I just think this place is awesome. We got incredible worship. We got great facilities. But I'm telling you, it will not touch the city, Orlando. It will not. Orlando's got great musicians all over the place. The number one church growth principle that I know, people go where they're loved. I promise you, if you love like Jesus, they will come. And they will find a home. I just think people go where they're loved. I had to go to Walmart yesterday morning early, one over on Kirkman, I got there like at 7.30 because I was in a hurry and I wanted to get in before it got crowded. There's a greeter. There's a guy standing there greeting you at 7.30 in the morning, welcoming me to Walmart. I walked in thinking, I've been to churches I didn't get a welcome like this. I mean, this Walmart, why can't the church figure this out? We could grow 10% just learning to smile. Hi, how are you? How are you? You know, it's real simple. Do we care? 
Are we like those four guys that are willing to do whatever because we care? And you know what? They know. They know if we care. You remember the Queen's Banquet we did the first time we ever did it? It's a ministry where we bring in women from uh, battered women's shelters, homeless shelters, off the street. In fact, many of these girls were prostitutes that worked the trail, that worked OBT. And we gave them all kinds of shopping opportunity, jewelry, all kinds of stuff. And I will never forget, two of them walked up to me as they were leaving. And they came over and said, hey, pastor, I think you know what we do for a living, right? I said, yeah, I think I know what you do. And they looked at me and said, you know, we've always known there was a big old church down here. You guys are kind of hard to miss. We just didn't know you cared for hookers like us until today. When she said that, what hit me was this. It's not enough to have a great location. It's not enough to have a big old building. Orlando wants to know, does First Baptist care for this city? Do we love the people of this city? And that's what these guys did. They loved him. And they said, we're going to bring him. We're going to do whatever it takes to get him there. And did you know it's the number one reason people go to church today? A friend brings them. It's still number one. Let's do something in this room. How many of you first learned about or came to First Baptist because you were invited by a friend or told about it by a friend? Raise your hand. Oh, my goodness. If I'm getting the count right, there would be 30 of us here if it wasn't for friends. <laughs> look, how many, look how many hands. It's unbelievable. That's how it happens. And here's what's crazy. Tom Rainer wrote a book in 2007. He did some research. It's called The Unchurched Neighbor. He says 82% of the unchurched world around us said they would be willing to go to church if somebody asked them. Guys, that's not rocket science. And we're near rocket science here. That's not rocket science. That's just a simple invitation. Hey, it's the NBA Finals. That's a layup, right? You don't miss layups. Please don't miss a layup. People around us would love to be invited. Well, these four guys invited their friend, and they carried him because they loved him. Third question, where did they take him? And the answer is Jesus. The only place that they knew that could heal him. The only person that they knew that could heal him. Do you know what we have to offer the city of Orlando? You know what is the only thing that makes a difference in the lives of people in this city? The only thing we have to offer is one. His name is Jesus Christ. And I believe, I believe he can still change lives. Do you believe that? Yeah. You believe he can still change lives? They believed it. They believed it, and they thought if we can get him there, he can change our friend's life. That's why they went up on top. That's why they dug through a roof. Why? If we can just get him to Jesus, Jesus can change his life. Do you know why I'm here today? The number one reason that my life is what it is today, number one, Jesus. Apart from him, I'm not here. And I want to tell you what, I have fallen madly in love with Jesus. And I am a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Every time I open this book, I'm amazed. I'm intrigued. And the more I learn about him, the more I realize he is the only thing we have to offer our world, Jesus Christ. So what we do is bring people to Jesus Christ. He can change them. He will transform their life. So they brought him. They got him there to Jesus. Now, here's what you need to know. As much as a layup would be for you to invite your neighbors to come, do you know how many Christians, of members of evangelical churches like ours, will actually invite somebody? This is a sad statistic. Only 2% of church members in America will invite a friend to come with them. I don't understand that. I, I, every time I read that, I think something's got to be wrong with that. Why would we not invite? So let me give you my answer. The only thing I can figure, now I, I love logic, so help me if my logic is off, okay? I know some of you will. <laughs> All right, here it is. Either we don't care or we don't think Jesus can change their life. 
Is there a third option? I, I can't think of a third option. So it's either we don't care for the city of Orlando, we don't care for the people around us, or we don't think he can change their life. But you see, I believe both of those are true about us. I believe we do care. I do care. And I believe he can change their life. So how about let's together do whatever it takes to bring Orlando to Jesus Christ. That's the hope. That's the goal. That's the vision that we have. He changed my life. He changed your life. I just believe that he can change anybody's life. Last question. How'd they get him there? How'd they get him to Jesus? And the answer, by doing whatever they had to do. This is the most amazing part of the story to me. They go to the house. They can't even get in the house. And then they go up on the roof. Now, let me tell you, to get up on the roof of those houses, it wasn't hard because they usually had stairs built, all right? And let me describe the house in that day. It was not an open floor plan, okay? It wasn't a Florida home where you walk in, you got openness everywhere. It was not that kind of house. The houses in the first century in that part of the world were real choppy. They had a little room, 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 room. I mean, everything was chopped up. So there's no tell. I don't even know how they knew where Jesus was. Where do you think he was that day in the house? The kitchen? I mean, that's where most people hang out, right? That's where I do my greatest speaking, in the kitchen. So who knows where he was? They, when they couldn't get in, they went up on the roof. Okay, watch this. They go up on the roof. And they're thinking to themselves, we got to tear this thing off. Now, that sounds like a simple task. That sounds like we just move the straw back. No. Luke, the gospel of Luke, when Luke tells this story, says that it was a tiled roof. Now, I, we don't have a tiled roof. Some of you have a tiled roof. When I was in college, I, uh, I started pastoring when I was 19. And the first job I got as a pastor was with one of our members who was a house builder. He was a contractor. I said, could I work for you? He said, are you serious? You really want to do hard work? I said, sure, I want to work. He said, I'll put you to work. You know where he put me? On the roofing crew. I prayed for deliverance all summer <laughs> for three years in a row. I kept asking God, what did I do wrong? What have I done, Lord? He <laughs> said, oh my goodness, it was horrible. And I remember we'd have to tear the roof off and then put another roof on. And one day we had a tiled roof house. Oh my goodness. That was unbelievable to try to get it off. Now I know houses back then aren't exactly like they are today. I'm just telling you, these guys went to a lot of trouble to tear a roof off and then take rope. And I mean, you got to lower the guy without dropping him. He's already a paralytic. Okay? So... You don't need a quadriplegic at the end of this story. So they're, they're lowering him. Why would they go to that much trouble? Because it was worth it. And I bet you if you meet that paralytic in heaven one day, he's going to tell you about those four guys that said, we love you and we'll do whatever it takes to get you to Jesus. So I got a question for you. Are you willing to help me tear the roof off this church and bring the city of Orlando to Jesus Christ. Are you willing to help me? And together, we find a way. Every church has a roof. Every church has a roof. Believe me, I've been doing this too long. Every church has a roof. And that roof represents a barrier. It represents a line in the sand that says we're not going past that. I'll tell you, let me give you some of them. Comfort and convenience. I've had people tell me in the past, not in this church, but other churches, you know, pastor, this is not the same church. We got a lot of people now, and I just, it's not the same. I don't like this. Why do you want so many? I had a guy one time look at me and say, when are we going to close membership? I said, what? He said, when are we going to close membership? Well, now, I'm going to tell you what I thought. But I did not say it. The Spirit helped me, okay? I held my tongue. What I thought was, well, we should have closed it the guy right before you. But I didn't say that. I said, I don't understand. He said, well, we got too many people here. 
I said, oh my goodness, there's never too many people in the, in the body of Christ. I've had people tell me, when I first got here, and people started coming, it doesn't look like our church anymore. There are people from all over the world. I hear languages I don't understand, and I'm going, hallelujah. Amen. And they're going, but, and, and, and I hear languages I don't understand, and they don't look like me. And I'm going, Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, it's all fun and games until you lose your parking space. It's all fun and games until you lose your seat. It's all fun and games until you are inconvenienced. And the moment a church becomes more concerned about its convenience than the world around it, it will die. And we will never be more concerned about our convenience. The root has got to go. Here's another rooftop. Us versus them. Us versus them. Meaning, well, why would we want them? They're sinners. Oh, my goodness. Do you know what they did this weekend? Do you know what they believe? And you know what? They believe, but they believe in abortion. They believe in this. And we can't let them in. Hang on. Time out. Us versus them? Well, let me give you a little information in case you've forgotten it. If it weren't for the grace of God, you would be them and not us, Right? And the only thing that makes it different is God's grace. And so I think this attitude of, oh, no, we can't have sinners in here. Well, then you just lost a pastor. I had a man say one time, I can't believe you invited that sinner. I won't tell you who he was referring to, but we had a guest. He said, I can't believe you invited that sinner to be at church. And I said, well, worse than that, there's a sinner that stands in front of you every week and preaches. And so if that man doesn't have a right to be there, neither do I. I just want you to know, this idea that we are better than them is a slap in the face of God's grace. There is one reason you and I are here. There's one reason I'm here. It's because he saved me. Not because I'm good. Not because I'm better than somebody else. It's just the grace of God grabbed my life one day and said, you're not going to destroy it, son. I got plans for you. And I am so thankful for the grace of God. Aren't you? The grace of God changed our life. So when I first got here, a lady called me aside and she said, I didn't like what you said. And I said, join the crowd. What? 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 What was it you didn't like? She said, I don't think the church is for lost people. I said, what? She said, I don't think the church is for people out there. I think it's for saved people. It's for Christians. And I said, well, how, where are you getting that? And she said, well, I think it's what the Bible teaches. And I just looked at her and said, no, honey, that's not what the Bible teaches. The last thing Jesus told us before he left us was go and make disciples of all the nations. That's the last thing Jesus said. And in Acts, the last thing he said before he ascended was, you are to receive power and then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. And I just said, I'm sorry, but that's not the way it's going to be. Well, she didn't stay long. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that's not the way it's going to be. We will do everything we can and whatever is needed to bring our city to Jesus Christ. Because I believe Jesus can change the city of Orlando. I believe he can change every person we bring. Now, I want to commend you for something. You are that kind of church. There are so many of you that believe exactly what I'm talking about. And some of you are getting there and struggling. That's okay, man. It's a struggle. One year ago, this next weekend, was the most horrible day in our history. The worst mass shooting in the United States happened in our city, in paradise. And I remember that morning... Every time we would finish one service and I would walk off the platform, Danny would meet me and say, the number's up to 25. There are now 30 confirmed dead. There are now 35 confirmed. I just remember thinking, God, no more, no more, no more. And that sent us into one of the most difficult seasons that I've ever walked through as a pastor or a person, and for sure as a church. 
And I want to tell you, I've never been more proud of First Baptist Orlando than in the days following Pulse. What you did, what we did together to open our arms and to embrace a hurting community. And we struggled with, and let's just be honest, okay? I mean, we're just, we're big boys here. Let's talk. The LGBTQ community had never felt that love. They told me, Pastor, we feel like you guys love us now, but we've never felt that before. And maybe it wasn't there. I don't know. But I know that for the last year, we have done things and ministered to people, and we've cared for people in the name of Jesus. And I am so thankful to be a part of First Baptist Orlando. So thankful. And I know this coming weekend, let me tell you what's going to happen. Get ready. We've invited every family of the victims, all 49 victims, we've invited their families. And through our Hispanic ministry and Pastor Israel Martin, we have put together a video of three of the survivors of the club shooting who have found Christ and who are now with us. And so next weekend, we, we could possibly have 30 of the families with us in the services. We're going to have some in each service, but we think probably the majority will be in this last service. I, I want you to know, I'm so looking forward to the way you're going to open your arms and love them and welcome them in the name of Jesus. Because remember, if we can get people to Jesus, He can heal broken hearts. And so having them here is going to be a great step in that direction. Now, when the roof started to fall, when the roof started to fall, there were some who didn't like it. And you need to get ready for that. When you start tearing roofs off, there are going to be people who don't like it. I would have thought Simon Peter would have spoken up. It was his house. You know, you would have thought he would have gone, wait a minute, guys. You can come in the door. You don't have to tear my roof off. It wasn't Simon Peter. Who was it? The scribes. You know who they are? The religious people. The religious people. They didn't like it. And guess what? They still don't. I wish I could tell you that the greatest resistance I've felt was from the lost world. No. The LGBTQ community has been gracious. And I could name a few names of the leadership of that community. And they have been so gracious to us in everything we've done. The government has been gracious to us. Other institutions that aren't church or faith-related have been gracious to us. Do you know where the criticism of First Baptist and the criticism of your pastor has come from? From brothers and sisters in Christ who don't even live here. They live somewhere, and they don't even know us, but they want to criticize us. But let me just tell you something. If you get criticized... Because you are loving people like Jesus, you ought to shout and praise the Lord to the top of your lungs. If you get criticized because you are welcoming sinners, we're going to look at Levi not long from now, verse 13. Matthew was a tax collector. When Jesus called him in, he got lit up by the religious people going, that's a sinner. What are you doing walking with that sinner? I just love it when we get to be like Jesus. But when we are, we're going to be criticized like Jesus was. But it's okay. All day long, I'll take that criticism. Because one day I will stand before him. And I want to know that I did everything I could to bring people to Jesus. So today, here's what I want us to do. You see these piles of rope? You're not supposed to take these and make ornaments with them or whatever. This is to remind you of something. They're going to be uh, on the tables back there. We got some in the balcony, guys. You don't have to take a day's journey to come down here. There's a, there's a table up there. And, and let me show you what I want you to do. We're going to sing a song together. And I want you, if you're willing to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to bring my friends to Jesus. I want you to take one of these. They're not magical it's not a novelty. It's not a gimmick. It's just a reminder. I have one in my office that I look at every day to remind me. If we got to tear a roof off, we're going to tear a roof off because I'm going to do whatever. And can you imagine those ropes 
as they let that guy down, those ropes, that was what enabled them to do it. Now, let me tell you a great place to start, bringing your friend to Jesus. Bring him to church because I'm going to make a promise to you. I want everybody to listen to this. I want to make a promise. As long as I'm here as your pastor, I promise you, when you bring your friend here, number one, we will not embarrass them. Number two, they will hear about Jesus Christ. I make that promise because you know why? I'm not preaching out of the Sentinel. I'm not preaching out of the Wall Street Journal. I'm not preaching out of some magazine. There is one book I will forever teach you from. It is the Word of God, the Bible. And I promise we will talk about Jesus. So bring them here. Just bring them with you. That's a great step in the process. So this morning, if you're willing, we're going to sing what a beautiful name. Because we're going to do this in His name. And as we're singing, don't feel like you have to. And please don't if you don't want to. But if you want to say, God, I'm going to find a way. Whatever roof i got to tear off, it's going because I'm going to bring someone to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, that beautiful name, we will be your church and we will bring anyone and everyone we can to Jesus.